going to involve finding distances, points of intersection, um, and also angles between, just like we did with lines. So just keep that in mind. Um, and you'll find there's some similarities as well. So the first is distances here. Um, and I've pre-written a fair bit of this because I know some of you like to read a little bit ahead. So that's why I've done that. Um, the distance between a point and a plane, first of all, is um, reasonably easy as long as you know some of the rules. And it's very procedural. You won't be asked to do much beyond this. So just keep that in mind. Um, in this diagram there, uh, here's a plane. We know the point P and Q describes our point that we're using to describe the plane. So if we know P and Q, then we know the value of PQ. So I'll just zoom in. I've stolen this from your textbook, by the way. So we know PQ. We know P, we know Q. The question will have asked us to find the shortest distance from point P to the plane, which is described as Q and with that um, N as well. So that will be R dot N equals Q dot N, and that will come up with a K value. Um, so the shortest distance to that plane is going to be D. The shortest distance will be the line that from P to the plane forms a perpendicular line. So what that tells you, and this is written here, is that the shortest distance will be such that the distance D, if that's a vector, the shortest distance will be the magnitude of vector D, where D is the line from the point to the plane that is parallel to N. So take a moment to think about that. N is the line that represents the um, vector perpendicular to the plane. And we also want D to be perpendicular to the plane, so N and D will be parallel. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a D. That is a vector from P to the plane that is parallel to N. Now, procedurally, this is not too bad. What this means is that cos theta, so if we know P and Q only, cos of theta equals D the thing we're trying to find, which is the shortest distance, over the magnitude of PQ. This is just right angle trig with some vector stuff in it. We can rearrange that to get D equals PQ times cos theta. And then we've done something magical here and inserted the, ma the magnitude of N, of the unit vector N. Can anyone tell me the magnitude of the unit vector N? One. One which is why it's okay to insert that, because we're just multiplying by one. Is everybody cool with that? So just to run through this again, that's just a right angle trig thing from this diagram. And then this is just a rearrangement, and this is just inserting multiplied by one. But that one is the magnitude of n, the unit vector that is parallel, uh, perpendicular to the plane. And if you go back and look at one of our versions of the dot product, the magnitude of PQ times the magnitude of the unit vector N times by cos theta is also a dot product between vector PQ and a unit vector N. And it's the magnitude of that. So if you go back to our sc uh, dot product, scalar product stuff from your lab, this relationship exists. You don't really need to know a lot about or remind yourself too much about that. Just know from this that if we want to find the shortest distance D to a plane from a point, then to get that shortest distance, we just work out the magnitude of the dot product between PQ and N. N will come from our description of the plane, and PQ will just have to be, you have to work out PQ from point P and from the point on the plane. Um, you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, if N is towards P, not away, then we have, well, you'll get a negative distance. Okay, don't have to be that careful because if you get a negative distance, you know that M was in the opposite direction to what you expected, so you just reverse it. Um, because remember our plane, here's our plane, it's described by some point and a vector that's perpendicular to it. If it's away, if the point's under here, and so N's away, then you'll get a positive distance, but if N's towards the point, you'll get a negative distance, which won't be a massive problem, you just note that and you change it to a positive distance. Quite abstract. I'd love to have more time than it. It's a really abstract concept. There's a really minor dot point in this topic. That it could, what could happen is we could get to the end of the external exam and you've not been assessed on it. That's my concern. So I don't want to spend ages on it. Um, what I want you to know is that if you get a question like this, you will need to simply 
apply that dot product idea and I'll show you an example of it in a moment. But I want to just take you through one specific case and this will be really important for when we do the distance between two planes. So the specific case is, what if O was the origin? And that might happen, or what if that point P is the origin O? Um, that might happen, it leads to some other, or a, a simplification of this. Um, so if we say, if O is the origin here, the special case of distances from the origin, we want to find M, which is that, this distance here, M, is the shortest distance from O to the plane, where capital N is the M is the point in the plane such that OM per, is parallel to N. That's what we're looking for. Um, so it'll mean that OM equals the distance times by the unit vector N, because OM um, is parallel to N, and N hat is the unit vector. So if we get this distance multiplied by the length one in that direction, we'll get that OM. Uh, we also know this is our vector form of a, um, of a plane. So R is just the generalised version of something that lies on the plane and M lies on the plane, so therefore R can represent M. So we get this. OM can be one of our points on the plane, so we can swap that for R. We get M N hat dot N equals K. And we can rearrange that. This is again just one of our um, our laws. It's it is the associativity law for scalar products. So it's fine for us to rearrange this to be m times n hat n equals r. And again, this little step here is just um, something that you might or might not be aware of, but you can just apply this rule. And that is that n hat n n hat dot n is just the magnitude of n. Um, because, again, if we go back to our graphical representation in the past of dot products, well, n hat n gives us that it's on the same line, so it means it actually just gives us the distance along that line. Um, I'm happy to go back and revisit with you individually if you want to, but for now, this rearrangement leads to the distance will be k, k which comes from that vector representation of a plane over the magnitude of n. And that's that's a very specific formula you can use. It's I would probably just build up an understanding of this through some examples, and then I'd have a bit of a crib sheet on this and keep it and use it. So before I go any further with that, does anybody have any questions? I will get to an example in a moment. Uh, I'm going to say five... G. Okay. Yep. I think it because it, I did 5 and F and G together because they're all the vector plane stuff, so I think this falls under 5G. Um, so the last thing I want to do before I bring in one example that combines everything, and this is really a simple add-on to what we've just talked about. If you want to find the distance between two parallel planes, and I've got a question there, why do they need to be parallel, but I'll ask you that in a moment. The shortest distance will be the distance along the line that is perpendicular to both planes. And the easiest way to get that shortest distance is to have that, so if I've got two planes, whatever they are, is to find that shortest distance by finding the line that is perpendicular to those two planes, wherever, they, wherever we are on those two planes, find the line that goes through the origin. So just move, um, for, for lack of a better thing, if I've got that as my shortest distance line, it's perpendicular to both. Okay, I'll move that around anywhere, it'll be the same length but I want to move it to the spot so that it's going through the origin. And then, so it's now going through the origin, which let's say is here. Then I just find the distance from plane one to the origin and the distance from plane two to the origin and add those together. And that will be our shortest distance. So if you can do what we just previously spoke about, you find the distance from plane one to the origin and then you find the distance from plane to the origin, add them together, and you will have found that distance between the, the two planes that goes through the origin, which will be the same shortest distance anyway. Why do you think the planes have to be parallel? Because they'll eventually intercept, which means distance is zero. Perfect. So if they're not parallel, they'll eventually intercept, which means the shortest distance will be zero um, in any case. So that's the, that's the situation there. Um, here's an example. The distance between 
plane one and plane two. So I've built this, I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to do it quick, so this example allows us to do those, um, or two of the processes at least, in one go. Okay? Um, so do anyone remember the last formula? Uh, we know that, well, sorry, the shortest distance will be the distance from plane one to the origin, distance from plane two to the origin added together. How do we find the distance from the plane to the origin? Does anyone remember the formula? K over the magnitude of n. Excellent. So m equals k over the magnitude of m, which came about from our dot product rule. So again, I would just get this formula and the other formula. It's complex, but the other formula was that the distance will be pq dot n hat, magnitude of that. Um, this one is for not origin type questions. Um, the distance pq dot n hat, that will be the distance there. So either of these, where that's origin based, and this is non origin based. We want to use the origin based one because we have the origin now. What's our k value for the first plane? k equals 8. So remember our form, like people have just said, is r dot n equals k. That's our form. What's the magnitude of n going to be? Four plus one plus nine. So what is it? Square root of fourteen. Okay, cool. Square root of fourteen. And therefore, m one is going to be eight over the square root of fourteen. And hopefully, you can see that in plane two, k equals five. N equals the square root of twenty-five plus four plus one which equals the square root of 30. So M2 is equal to 5 over the square root of 30. I should simplify these. Thirds in the denominator is not good. I should simplify them, but I've decided I'll simplify them at the end once I've worked out what the overall um, value is. And so therefore pi 1 plus pi 2, our uh, distance is 8 over root 14 plus 5 over root 30. And in actual fact, I'm not going to simplify it because you could simplify it if you needed to. In this exam, um, you could simplify that in a tech free, but it's not really what we're assessing you on. So we might give you that in a tech active, in which case you could simplify it in your calculator, but otherwise I don't really care. Any questions on that? So you've got a couple of options. We could delve into this for a couple of lessons. I'm not going to because we don't really have the time. Um, you should spend some time in the textbook and on these notes reading through and just making sure you understand the process. That's what complex familiar um, attaining students will be able to do. But really for complex familiar or simple familiar, um, this is going to be follow that rule kind of stuff. So the other option is I could just present you the rule, which is kind of what I've done. If there are no questions, would you like me to give you, actually specifically point out a couple of questions to practice that skill before I do the next section? Or would you like me to go straight in the next section? I've heard one vote for straight in the next section. Well, that's actually the question I've just asked. Would you like me, I'll repeat the question, would you like me to just go straight on to teaching you how to do intersections so you can do the whole lot? Okay. All right. I'm just going to talk about the intersection stuff then. And then, yes, I'll be able to help with 5F or anything else. Okay. Um, so, intersections. You might be asked to do um, a couple of things. First, find a point of intersection of a line and a plane. Second, find the intersection of a plane and a plane. So there's a few things that could happen here. Um, a line, so here's my plane, here's my line. Doesn't matter what happens. The line and the plane will intersect at one point unless the line is parallel to the plane, in which case they'll intersect at no points or an infinite number of points. Can we see that? In your exam, you're either going to have to do a two or three mark question which might ask you to find the points of intersection or something like that and prove to me that it doesn't intersect or it intersects at infinite points 
or you'll have to follow the process of finding that one point. Okay? Uh, that's, a, that's a line and a plane. A plane and a plane will intersect at a line's worth of points. See how a plane and plane will intersect at a line unless they're parallel, in which case they might intersect at a plane or they might intersect never. But the answer to this will be a line. So you'll have to find a line where a plane and a plane intersect. If you have three planes, what could happen then? I've only got two hands. There's one plane, there's two planes, there's three planes, what do they intersect at? A point. A point. Okay, <laughs> now, hold on a second. I'm recording this. <laughs> Alright. Um, if, if the planes are parallel and turn out to be the same, they could intersect. If two planes are parallel and aren't the same, they might not intersect at all. But generally speaking, you're getting a point. Three planes, three three-dimensional things will intersect at a point. Two three-dimensional things will break. It's basically, it's like differentiation. You differentiate a cubic, you're going to get a quadratic. If you've got two three-dimensional things, you're going to get a two-dimensional thing. That's kind of what's happening, OK? Um, so let's run through this quickly. There's your two options. A line and a plane. Here is our notation for a line, and here's our notation for a plane. There are representations that we've been using. So can we get uh, multiple plane intersections for like a complex arm? For what, sir? A complex arm for maybe multiple plane intersections. Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a fair bit of coverage in your textbook which will make them familiar. Um, so your complex unfamiliar is more likely to not just be, oh, here's a really hard plane to f find an intersection point. It's more likely to be um, something like um, two, three planes meet and form a triangle of solutions. What's the area of that triangle? See how that's got an extra step? You'd have to then find the lengths and the angles between and work out the area of the triangle. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be less about the making it really complex and more about providing you an opportunity to show the skills within multiple skill and processes. Um, so they intersect, a line and a plane intersect where the value of lambda, or at the value of lambda, such that the line dot n, so remember we've got our line is equal to this. So if you put this bit into here, into the plane form, where the lambda value is such that that is equal to k. That's what you're looking for. So again, it sounds really complex, but it's not that bad. You just need to substitute those values in appropriately. So here's an example. So I know people are writing this down. Determine the point where the line that intersects this plane. So the first thing to do is get this plane and write it in that r dot n equals k form. We've got our k. Our r dot n is going to be xi plus yj plus zk dot 3i plus 6j plus, or so, minus um, 1z, or just so not z, minus 1k, and that has to be equal to 10. So k, the scalar, which is 10, not to be confused with k, the vector, which is the third dimension, and this is our r. So we can swap that r out for the fact that it has to be on that line. So swap it out for the line representation of r, and we get this. 2i minus j plus lambda i plus j minus k. That's now our x, y, z. Dot 3i plus 6j minus k equals 10. I'm going to do an extra step here. It's a bit onerous, this task. You might skip one of these two steps I've just done. Um, but I'm now going to write this out in i, j, and k form, just so we've got the complete answer on here. This is 2 plus lambda i, and then it's um, plus negative 1 plus lambda j, and then minus lambda, that's a k, minus lambda k, dot 3i plus 6j minus k equals 10. Remember, we should be able to solve this for lambda. It's the line is the solution such that lambda um, makes this work. 
So I do the dot product, evaluate it. Remember when we were evaluating dot product, we just multiply our i components, multiply our j components and our k components. So I get 3 times 2 plus lambda plus 6 times negative 1 plus lambda minus 1 times negative lambda, and that has to be equal to 10. And that gives me 6 plus 3 lambda, uh, that's not a plus, uh, minus 6 plus 6 lambda, and then plus another lambda has to be equal to 10. They cancel out. 3 lambda, 6 lambda, and lambda. Wouldn't you believe it? 10 lambda equals 10. What? Lambda equals a beautiful number 1. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And... Now, we've, we've found the lambda value, remember, that we should get a point. So we've got a line intersecting with a plane. That should give us a point solution. And so therefore, at lambda equals 1, r is equal to 2i minus j plus i plus j minus k. Because lambda is 1, I'll just put a 1 there. And that gives me 3i. Uh, minus j plus j, and then my k. So that plane and that line intersect at the point 3i minus k. Now, what do you think is going to happen if there are an infinite number of solutions or no solutions? Lambda, if no solutions, lambda will equal zero. Lambda, well, lambda can equal zero, and that still gives us just one solution. Um, there won't, that's a good answer, that's what usually happens, but it's not a divide by zero. In what way? There is no lambda. Okay, so you'll get here, and lambda will cancel itself out. And you'll be left with something like this. Either A will equal B, where A and B are not the same number, that's a constant, that means no solutions. Or you'll get A equals A, like here you could have got 10 equals 10, and that, oh sorry, that's 10. A equals A, where A, the two numbers are equal, in which case you'll get a line of solutions. So you've got two options there. Either lambda can be everything, or lambda can be nothing, and it will come through either by a numerical contradiction, or a numerical definitive, where 10 equals 10, and that's just true. And lambda can be anything. Does that make sense? So just look, when you're practicing in the textbook, which I hope that this is really complex, so I hope that you're not going to just finish what, and then go back and carry on working in next chapter four or something, that you'll actually practice some of these things. When you're practicing in the textbook, look for these differences and look for these things that pop up. Um, that's example six. I have to talk about plane and plane. Remember if they're parallel, they might not meet, or maybe they meet infinitely. But if a plane and plane are not parallel, then they meet at a line. So let's talk about that. And again, what we're doing is theoretically massively abstract, but the mathematical process you'll follow to answer these are usually pretty simple, which I hope you'll agree that wasn't actually that bad mathematically. So again here, um, what we're going to do is let x be lambda. So we're going to just let it be a parameter. Work out the value of y and z in terms of x, or in this case in terms of lambda, and then solve the two planes in Cartesian form. Um, and there's an example. So example seven, determine the vector equation of the line where those two meet. And... So we've got um, plane one, and plane 2, but we're going to set lambda as x and then solve in both cases. Sorry if you're writing down stuff previously. Hopefully you can see that in plane 1, we get 3x plus 2y minus z is equal to 7, and in plane 2, we get x minus 3y plus 3z is equal to 6. So this has gone now from being a complex looking um, vector thing, and, and uh, this is my point of view anyway. I look at the vector thing, I don't deal with this stuff very much, and it looks complex and I've got to really think about it, to being basically a simultaneous equation in terms of x, y, and z. But as we get into chapter six and seven, you'll recall that 
two simultaneous equations with three unknowns, you are probably not going to be able to solve that. But we can solve it if we put a parameter in. So we can solve for the parameter. And that's basically what we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to start by rearranging to eliminate either Z or Y. You could put your parameter in early, but I'm going to rearrange first. Um, so I'm going to rearrange, in this case, um, I'm just going to multiply this one by 3, and then I'm going to add them both together. So I'll get equation number 1 is 9X plus 6Y minus 3Z equals 21, and then X minus 3Y plus 3Z equals 6, and then when I add those together, I'll get 10X plus 3Y is equal to 27. And that tells me that y is equal to 27 minus 10x over 3. Oh, that's a line. Is that, okay. Sorry, is that all right? Okay, cool. And so with that in mind, I could write this down as 9 minus 10 thirds x. And if I let x equal some parameter lambda, could be t, could be pi, could be... Uh, mu, whichever one you want to use, then I get y is equal to 9 minus 10 over 3. And I know my y, I know my x, let's find my z. So in number 1, what was number 1? 3x plus 2y minus z was equal to 7, and that tells me that z is equal to 3x plus 2y minus 7. I've just done a bit of rearranging there. Hopefully you can follow that or do it yourself. Remember x is equal to lambda and y is equal to 9 minus 10 thirds of lambda which means that I get 3 lambda plus 2 times 9 minus 10 thirds lambda minus 7. Let's move down so 3 lambda plus 18 minus 20 thirds Lambda minus 7. Um, now, 20 thirds lambda is 6 and 2 thirds. I'm taking that away from 3 lambda. That gives me, well, 3 lambda is 9 thirds of lambda. So that gives me negative 11 thirds. And then 18 minus 7 is plus 11. So that's my representation for Z, which means that every solution can be represented by a different lambda value. And all of my solutions are, I might just have to create a bit of space. All of my solutions that work are R equals lambda i, that's my x value, plus 9 minus 10 thirds lambda j plus, um, I don't know, do that actually, 11 minus 11, that's pi, thirds lambda k, sorry about that, put brackets around those. That's my ijk representation. Now watch me break this down into a line equation. That's equal to 9j plus 11k and then plus lambda times i minus 10 thirds, jeez, that's pi again, um, j minus 11 thirds k. And this I hope you can see, is a line. Remember our line is R equals A plus lambda D. So our direction vector is this one here. And this is our initial value vector here. That's our A and that's our D. So don't forget, if you're faced with these questions, particularly in the exam situation, you can visualize this right then and there. Two planes should intersect at a line. I'm expecting to get the equation of a line and when I go into here I'm going to put this together such that I get an equation of a line. Now obviously I wouldn't expect you to be able to just guess to use x as a um, parameter which is why I've shown you how to do this but the end result is a line equation and that's what we were expecting to get. Does it matter you use x, y, z? No, and remember when we went and did those line equations and we said look here's one point, here's my line pick an initial point, could be here, could be there, could be there, I'll pick this one, 
and then pick a lambda, the direction could be this long, could be that long. And remember we said there's an infinite number of lines. In this case, I let x equal lambda, that will give me one specific line. If I let y equal lambda, I'll get a different one. If I let um, x equal 5 lambda plus 2, I'll get a different one again. So the choice you make there, that varies your line. Typically, I would expect you to use x equals lambda. If I put this into an exam, my solution that I will have x equals lambda, so if you want to make my life easy, do x equals lambda, otherwise I've got to go through and work out if yours works as well. If it wasn't for confirmation, Connor, I'd definitely sarcastic comment on anyone who makes it complex for me. No, because that, that won't work. So you, know, you can do that at your own peril. Um, I'm, I've got no examples of this. Can I just remind you that if you need to find the angle between two planes, well, the angle between two planes will be, if you determine the direction vector of those two planes, it'll be the angle between the two direction vectors. The angle between a line and a plane will be the angle between the direction of the line and the plane. But you do have to remember, what's our direction vector for a plane? Our line has a direction vector of D. How do we represent a plane? <coughs> that's what we call it, yeah, N. Remember N? N. We don't actually represent it by a line that's parallel to the plane, we represent it by a line that's perpendicular to the plane. So if you get your N for both of them, and you find the angle between the two normal vectors, that will be the same as the angle between the two planes. Can everybody see that? So I've got my, my two planes are there. So my normal vectors, so I'm going to put that down. One normal vector is out of the page. The other normal vector is through that page. They're both 90 degrees from the plane. That means the angle between the two normal vectors will just be a 90 degree rotation around from the two planes but the difference between them will be the same, okay? The confusion comes, and maybe it's already come, but just take some time to think about that. The confusion comes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just about to finish. Sorry. The confusion comes if you have a line and a plane, and I've written all this down here. A line direction vector is parallel to the line, a plane's direction vector is, uh, is perpendicular. If you're finding the angle between N of the plane and D of this line, that will actually be 90 degrees minus the actual angle you want. So there's my line and there's my plane. I want that angle in between here. But you're going to calculate the angle between N and the plane, and sorry, and the line, which will be this one. You have to do 90 minus that to get the angle between the line and the plane. Take some time to think about that. I've drawn it here and written some stuff down. It's also in your textbook and they have some nice diagrams. I'd suggest you have a look at those. Um, it's been...